The Odd, Unexplained, and Top Secret. Today we're going to be talking about weird weapons. <clears throat> and the picture you've seen there is a, I mean, the one I start off with, it's called the Rod from God. And the Rod from God is a kinetic weapon. There's no warhead, there's no rockets, there's no nothing. It's literally in orbit. You let it go and let gravity do the work. How this thing works is it's literally in a satellite. You position the satellite over what you want to destroy. Aim it. And let go of the rod. Gravity pulls it down to the target. And the kinetic ener energy alone destroys the target. Uh, in fact, it hits with, I think I said, 11,000 tons. Well, the explode, its concussive impulse, it's like 11,000 tons of TNT. That's going to be a bad day for somebody. And the reason why they use tungsten is tungsten has an insanely high melting point of 6,000 degrees. <clears throat> so it can survive intact re-entry. Um, going into re-entry, they figure it's going to be traveling, I think they said something like 15 times the speed of sound. So we're well past hyper velocities here. After re-entry and it hits Earth's atmosphere, it's going to slow down to about nine times the speed of sound, or about three miles a second. Which, that's still moving. And how big is this thing? Not really that big. Look at your, when you go driving around, look at a telephone pole. Now picture that telephone pole with a couple little fins on one end and a pointy end on the other. All made out of tungsten. That's the rod from God. It's only about 60, only about, I think they said, maybe about a foot wide and about 20 feet tall. That's it. But that's kind of like our first for, foray. Lay down, buddy. Talk to my dog, sorry. That's our first for, foray into weird weapons. And there's there's a bunch more of them. Um, gotta go through and let me pull this up here. Boink. Hold on. Flip up. There we go. This little deal here. Yes, that's a Vespa. Was an anti-tank rifle on it. Now that what they have here is kind of kind of uh, short and sweet. The Vespa scooter was modified for French par paratroops in 1956. Though the rifle was meant to be removed from the scooter to aim and fire, it could also be fired while the scooter was moving. Okay. Let's take a look at this. We have about a two-inch gun mounted on a Vespa scooter that can take out tanks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, can, I can see the logic in this. Um, the Vespa scooter, though small, is surprisingly very... I won't say the greatest off-road, but it can be ridden on just about any terrain and not really have that much of an issue. Um, <clears throat> and it's a lot lighter than dropping a motorcycle. You could use a regular parachute on that, throw it out, have the paratroopers come out after it. They can see where it lands, land close to it, pick it up, and away they go. So... I I can I can see the logic in it. 
Is it the greatest idea? No, not really, but it it could it could work. Uh, until you go try to kill a tank while you're driving the thing at the tank at about 40 miles an hour and you shoot the rifle, which means that Vespa's probably going to come, if it doesn't blow over backwards, it's going to come to a complete stop. <laughs> but it is what it is. Okay, the next one. Here we go. I don't know if you can see that too well. That is the Bat Bomb. The Bat Bomb. The United States developed the Bat Bomb as an experiment during World War II. The giant case is filled with more than 1,000 compartments, each containing a Mexican free tail bat attached to small bombs. Ooh. The idea was the bomb would be dropped with a parachute. The bats would be deployed, they would roost in attics, their bombs would go off, and fires would be started in Japanese cities. Hey, what's up, Carol? This is not the first time, and you'll see in this list, it's not the first time they tried to use animals for warfare. Um, this is another one I read about, and not, hey, Tibor, not the, the greatest of ideas, but I can could, I could see the logic behind it. But um, there, some of the problems they have with this. Oh, okay. The problem that they had with this bomb was, is there's times that when they would release the bomb, the little mini bombs on each bat would start going off before the before the bomb would ever open up and let the bats out. So, you're actually killing your weapon before the weapon actually gets deployed. Hey, what's up, Q? Yeah, but the balloon bombs actually worked. It just... It wasn't a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And the funny thing about it is, is I think every now and again, here on the American mainland, they'll... Hey, Bob... They'll find one of them. They actually made it over here. Little bomb is still attached to it, laying out in the middle of the woods someplace, usually in Oregon or Washington, sometimes California. And I think they found I think they found one in Nevada or Idaho, one of the two, but it was a Japanese balloon bomb. Those things were kind of ingenious in the way they worked. They would it was basically a hot air balloon that they would put a heat source under. It would rise up, catch the air currents, and start just ride a prevailing wind across the Pacific. Uh, some went down. Yes, it did. So those ones, it was more of a terror weapon than it was a tactical weapon, but they worked. Still another weird weapon, so you, bonus. Up, I'm okay. I'm not going to show the picture on this one because all oh, this is a picture of a cat. But this is called Operation Acoustic Kitty. During the Cold War, the CIA came up with a plan to stick microphones in cats' ears and radio transmitters in their cat skulls in order to spy on the Russians. Brilliant. Now we're going to get to the first official test. For its first official test, CIA, CIA staffers drove Acoustic Kitty to the park and ta tasked it with capturing the conversation of two men sitting on a bench. A redacted government memo read, instead the cat wandered into the street where it was promptly squashed by a taxi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, other than the obvious, cats do what cats want to do. That's, that's it. That Cats are their own little animal. Uh, cats do cat things. And it's never what you want them to do. Hardly ever. Now, if they task it with going in and knocking stuff off the mantle of the White House, I'd probably be more than happy to do that. But, yeah, not... not not one of the CIA's. 
Yeah, that was an that was another one. And they did that, I think, the whole way up through the nineties. If it wasn't planting bombs, they were using dolphins to look for underwater mines. Which they were very adept at doing. Okay, the Who Me Stink Bomb. Yeah, this is not a joke. <laughs> Who Me was a sulfur st stink bomb that the U.S. created during World War II. It smelled like poop and was meant, it was meant to be used to humiliate and demoralize German troops. The plan failed since the soldier who did the spraying often ended up smelling as badly as the spray E. Well, you know what they say. He who dealt it smelt it, right? I mean, there's some, in this in this list I'm kind of reading here, there, there's some good ones, and there's some, like, what were these people thinking? This is one of those, what were those people thinking type of things. Now, this thing, now, this thing is kind of neat. Can I see all those lipstick things? Not what it seems. The Kiss of Death. The Kiss of Death was a lipstick gun created by the Russians during the Cold War. It would shoot one bullet from a tube of lipstick. That is slick. Okay, Tibor. But, um, that is something that, at the time... They weren't using metal detectors. This is all pre, pre the wall coming down. So you could slide a, a lady could slide that in her purse, go in, do the deal, put the cap back on it, put it back in her purse, walk back out. No baby any, any the wiser. So that was kind. Of, that was kind of a slick idea. And it's not the first. It's not the first small gun we're going to see in this. Um, small guns were used for a lot of things. They they would put a, a gun in a camera, like a small cannon like camera. Um. Uh, they put gun, They put like a twenty two caliber gun in a pen. Um. All kinds of stuff like that. If it was small and they could put a gun in it, they would figure out how to put a gun in it. And talking about guns, this is one you guys probably seen from World War One. That would be the Paris gun. The Paris gun was used by Germans against the French during World War One. Though the guns giant shells were the first human-made objects to reach the stratosphere. Yeah, they... It went, it went high, it went long. It had terrible aim and was mostly used as a psychological weapon. Again, a terror weapon. But, um, yeah, I've, I've seen other pictures of it. That picture does not really do it justice. Um, the Paris gun actually rode on two railroad tracks, not one, but two, side by side. It was about 100 feet long, and it would shoot projectiles about 25 miles. I mean, pop them up in the stratosphere, and they would come down inside a ring. You paint it like about one or two mile ring on the ground, and they would come down in there someplace, someplace. So it was a, it was like a best guess type of thing because at twenty five miles away in the cur curvature of the Earth, at that time you're not going to target too good, so you're basically going to point and pray. So they would shoot this thing in the air, and it just land someplace in Paris. That's all they did: land someplace in Paris. So. It was one of those deals that you just launch a couple of those shells into Paris and where they landed, they landed. You're messing with the head of head of your of your perceived enemy. 
and the more you mess with their head, if they don't know where anything's going to hit, the better you can manipulate the outcome of what's going to happen. Didn't quite work because we won that one too, but <sighs> the Krumlov curved rifle, this is one of the Nazis' great ideas. Notice I said that sarcastically. <laughs> the Nazis invented the curved rifle to shoot around corners and over walls. It didn't work for obvious reasons. Um, that rifle, you can get like, if you weren't pushing it too hard, you can get a couple, two, three shots out of it. But about the third or fourth shot, once the barrels start getting warm at the curve, the projectile would seize up in the barrel, causing the gun to explode. So if you only had to put one or two shots out of it, and you weren't just blah, 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 you could probably get by with it. If you had to do more than four, you better be pulling a string from a distance because that, that gun's going to blow up in your face. <laughs> Now, here's an interesting one. Now, this is not the Allied or the American version of it, though. It's a bouncing bomb. And this is where the Americans got the idea of a bouncing bomb to use on dams or the dam breacher project. So there's a... Both sides play with the idea. The 9,000-pound motorized bomb was dropped from Nazi planes into the water. It would then bounce along the surface until it was over a submarine, then sink and explode. Well, that didn't quite work. What would happen was the bomb would hit the water and just bounce right on over to the submarine and keep on going until it just lost kinetic energy. Then it would sink and explode and there would be nothing there. Now, the Americans, along with the British who helped them build it, made the Bouncing Betty, which was another bouncing bomb that they would use to breach dams over in Europe in Nazi-occupied countries. Now, the concept with that was is they would drop it in the motor instead of running... Just, you know, it, instead of going like this when they dropped it, they're going this way instead of it going, they actually rotated backwards. So it would bounce until it hit the dam, and then the rotation would make it actually roll right down the side of the dam. And once it hit certain depths, it explode and breach the dam. Was actually somewhat effective. Uh, wasn't the wasn't the most effective, but it worked. And it worked in a couple missions to perfection. And the whole thing was was the rotation. The Germans were trying to rotate it this If they're flying this way, the Germans are trying to rotate it this way to keep it bouncing. Well, the Americans and the British turned it backwards. So once it actually hit a target, it would spin, then go right down the target and explode. Uh, very effective. Ah, the man catcher. Now, this was used in 18th century Europe. Very interesting looking device. And you have to remember, they're using this against mostly armored knights. This pull weapon was used in 18th century Europe to pull people off of horses and drag them to the ground. The victim would typically be wearing armor so the prongs didn't kill him. But looking at that, you had that space at the top. Well, that was kind of like spring metal. You would actually hit them in the neck with that and it opened up enough to get their head in that loop where the back would close and it would just... Grab them and yank. Um, highly, it was actually highly effective. They call it a weird weapon, but it was proven time and time again to work. 
uh, many a night got got captured by that thing. Okay. The next one. The Bulgarian Umbrella. This is one I never heard of. And that's the mechanism there. Okay, so we got a trigger and umbrella handle. Linkage system connecting trigger to valve. Spring to push the linkage system. Switch that activates valve. Cylinder of compressed air. Valve that fires a ricin pellet through the barrel of the umbrella. So yeah, this, this was a chemical weapon in an umbrella. This umbrella can contain a chamber from which a poisonous pellet could be fired was reportedly used in the assassination of a Bulgarian dissident writer in 1978. The writer thought he had been stung by a bee and died three days later. Man, ricin ain't, ain't no joke, man. That's some pretty serious stuff. But, again, it's one of those weapons hidden in plain sight. Um, could there be a better delivery system? Probably. But nobody's going to think to walk in an umbrella. <laughs> oh, there you go. <clears throat> but, yeah, but with this umbrella weapon, <laughs> this is, it's kind of ingenious, and it's been, it was a, basically an assassination tool, not, not a tool for war, an assassination tool, and with that Bulgarian writer in 1978, it's been shown to work. The Wagnaka. Now, this is a rather interesting deal here, too. The ancient claw-like blades were used in India to slide over the knuckles and be used in a wolverine-like way, or werewolf-like way. Well, once you see the claws here, It's kind of like a spiked pair of brass knuckles. <laughs> a trained eunuch maker. Now this year, now these weren't all only used in India. Uh, in feudal, they had a deal like this in feudal Japan where the, that the ninjas would use as well. Um, and not only were they used for defense, they would be used to climb with. Uh, there are stories of ninjas using these things to climb trees, climb up, climb up the corner of buildings, uh, all kinds of stuff. And then defensively, um, they could be used they could be also used as well as a slashing or stabbing weapon. Uh, they call it a weird weapon here, but you know, back in the day, especially in feudal Japan, when it came to ninja, that was standard issue. <laughs> okay, the laser plane. Now, this one's from 2007, so this one isn't that far off. And it was actually proven to, they tested it, and they proved the, the idea to work. And it wasn't that much retro, there was some retrofitting to some planes, but it worked, it was highly effective, and it could be made to work again in real-time conflict. Is a good this little deal right here. 
No, Bob's still in here. He probably recognizes the plane. First test in 2007, the, Bo the Boeing YAL-1 was a prototype air aircraft developed to ho house a laser system that could be used to destroy targets with concentrated bursts of energy. The concentrated burst of energy was a laser. And what it was for was missile defense. Now, instead of just having one, the idea was to have many of those flying in certain around the perimeter of the country. So, once one took, once one landed, there would already be another one in the air. So they would go in shifts, and what they would do, they would patrol for missile launches. And once the missile got so high, they could walk onto it, hit with the laser beam, and destroy it while it was still going up. And if it actually made its apogee and started coming back down, they could still get it destroyed before it hit the ground. The only thing faster than a hypersonic missile is a weapon that works at the speed of light. So it was actually a very ingenious idea that was proven to work. And now we go to ancient Greece, the Claw of Archimedes. Interesting looking thing. Um, and this this was theoretical because they have a picture of it here, but they don't really know if there was actually one used or not. There it is there, holding up a ship. Get, looks like it's getting ready to dunk the ship in the water. You know, dunk a carpet. <laughs> But the naval weapon was, this naval weapon was built by the ancient Greeks to defend against the Romans. It's thought that it was a crane grappling hook that could lift enemy ships out of the water and then tip or drop them, you know, capsize them, whatever. Um, if it was indeed a real weapon, that wasn't genius. The question is, is how many people did it take to operate? Because you have to remember, back in those days, they didn't have that much mechanical advantage. Unless they had some kind of squirrel cage winch system hooked up to it to either lift it or drop it, one of the two. And what I mean by squirrel cage is there's a gigantic wheel with a rope around it, and you have a bunch of people running in it, so either turn it one way or turn it the other. So, in theory, it's great. And Archimedes had a bunch of them. They actually had, there's an, actually an Archimedes death ray. Now, if you ever watched Mythbusters, they actually put it to the test, and it, in theory, worked. Uh, what the death ray was... In Archimedes' time, was there was a fleet attack? I can't remember if it's a Roman or if it's a Spartan fleet attacking Greece. The soldiers shined up their bronze shields, almost a mirror-like, and reflect, would catch a reflection of the sun, and shined it right on the ship, and they all shined on the same spot, which caught the ship on fire. Interesting idea. They did this on Mythbusters, and they actually, they didn't catch the wood on fire, but they caught the sails on fire. Now, on a real ship, you catch the sail on fire, that's usually more than enough to get, at least get the mast burning. If you can get the mast burning and get that burning down to the, down to the hull, now you've got problems. Because <laughs> what's going to happen is that mast is going to burn through and fall on that wooden deck. When it falls on a wooden deck, which usually has some kind of naphtha on it for ship-to-ship -ship warfare, that's going to light that naphtha up real quick. Once that naphtha goes, and naphtha, if you didn't know, is kind of like an ancient version of napalm. But once that stuff starts going... So... What, 
with that death beam, if you could start the fire, and especially if that ship was carrying Napsa, that ship may have been doomed. Uh, the, the Habakkuk. Another World, World War II deal. No, you're going to look at this and be like, okay, what is... It's a ship. You're probably going to ask yourself, what is so weird about that ship? Here we go. Developed during World War II, the Habakkuk would have been made from a, from, of a, of a material called piecrete, which was a combination of wood pulp and water that, when frozen, could be molded and held up to melting and held up to melting temperatures far longer than ice. Yes, it was a battleship made out of water and wood pulp that was frozen. But they found out it could float, and it was almost as strong as steel. The only problem was, is you, it would it would melt once the temperatures got above above freezing. Now it lasts longer than regular ice would, but it would still melt. So if you're attacking during the winter time, you're golden. If you're attacking during the summertime, you're lucky you can make it from the uh, the American ports. To Britain before the lifeboats were, were uh, deployed. So, yeah. great idea in theory, but in practicality, yeah, not so much. The sun gun. Now, we just kind of talked about this a little bit with Archimedes. The Germans took it a step further. Invented by the Germans during World War II, the planned sun gun would have harnessed the power of sunbeams to boil water sources and burn cities. A satellite would have been positioned in orbit with a mirror attached to it that would, that would allow the focused sunlight to be directed at a target. Um, you've seen some of this in James Bond. Can't remember what movie... I think it was the one that had Halle Berry in it. But it is a supercharged version of the Archimedes Death Ray. And during World War II, in fact, I'll show you the picture of it here. There's the picture of it. Now, the problem is, is making a mirror that big and getting it in space, especially during World War II, which we did not have anything in space. We didn't have any satellites, no nothing. Uh, Von Braun was barely breaking the stratosphere, or barely breaking into outer space with the V-2. And that was just momentary, momentary before it come back down. And the V-2... Guidance system wasn't the greatest. Better than the V1 buzz bomb, but still not the greatest. Um, it's one of those deals that, in theory, was a great idea. In practicality, not so much. Sorry, it's been a long day at work, so you know how that goes. Okay, we're, we have another one here with animals. Not the biggest fan of these, but still bears repeating. This 1931 photo, let me show you the photo here. Yes, yeah, I would love to do this on my computer. It's still acting up, so yeah. I'm doing the best I can with what I got to work with here. This 1931 photo shows a Soviet military dog training school where canines were trained to be strapped with explosives and run under enemy tanks. Oh, thank you, Q. Since the dogs have been trained with non-moving tanks, they were frightened during the actual battle and, more often than not, ran back to the trenches where they exploded and killed the Soviet troops. That's one of those deals where... The weapon that they created kind of took them out instead of taking out the enemy. Um, 
as I said, not the biggest fan of some of these things, but they, they kind of bears repeating. Okay, Le Petit Protector Ring Gun. Oh, exactly, Q. I, I agree. And now, this is a very interesting little device here. The ring gun. And the thing about it is, is you could probably make one of those today. Uh, the 19th century gun was marketed to women and had the ability to fire bullets with just enough force to penetrate the side of a tin can. Okay. <laughs> Now, the thing with this deal is, I'm looking at it, it holds six shots. So it's basically like a little mini revolver on a ring. Now, you could probably make one of those in 22 long rifle. Which I'm looking at the cartridge there. The cartridge isn't that much bigger than a 22, but it is like a. Instead of being rim fired, it looks like it's almost like a lever fire. There's a little lever sticking out that actually um, uh, set the shell off. Now, if you did that in rim fire, that'd be a good little defensive weapon, honestly. And a 22 short can mess somebody up in short order. So that's that's kind of like one of those things that maybe at the time it wasn't the greatest idea. I think I will maybe worth revisiting. Okay, and anybody who Okay, this next one here, um, I'm sure you guys probably seen pictures of this thing before. It's a form of an active denial weapon. And it was actually used here around Pittsburgh once. The microwave blaster or an active denial non-lethal weapon. The active denial system is a non-lethal weapon that would subdue enemy forces or rioting crowds by broadcasting microwaves at a particularly high frequency causing intense pain and discomfort. And um, they used this at, or whatever G it was anyway, when it was held here in Pittsburgh. They had riding outside. They couldn't get the riding to uh, subside, so they called in one of those things. <laughs> yep. They brought in this active denial, this microwave, this microwave weapon, dispersed people real quick. Um, and that's one of those things. If you stand in the way of this thing, it's going to mess you up in short order. So, this one's been proven to work. It has been used on a, a few, if not many occasions, and it worked every single time it was used. A harmonica gun. Oh, boy. Now, this thing is an interesting piece of work, too. But it was one of the first attempts at a repeating pistol. And instead of having a cylinder, it had that kind of like a slide magazine to it, which made it rather unique. Though this, we though this weapon invented in 1834 does not actually make music, its sliding magazine chambers oddly resembled those of the harmonica. That was one of the precursors to the revolver. Uh, the revolver did not really come out until about the 18... I'm thinking late 
40s at the earliest. In about the 1850s, it was finally in, I want to say full production, but there were a lot more people. And that was a single action. The double action, I think, came about mid to late 1850s. A single action, a double action. A single action is you have to cock it, then you can fire it. You cock it, then you fire it. Double action is you actually start cocked. But once you pull the trigger, you just keep pulling the trigger and it self set it's, it set itself until you ran out of shells. But for a first try for a repeating handgun, that was a good try. I'll give them that much. It's a good try. Very impractical though, because once unless you had another magazine ready to go. Once you're done that magazine, you had to kind of the cap and ball thing with throw it back and start all over. And not the fat in the field. Ah, oh, one from the Koreans. The fly gun. And that looks like it has about three shots in it. I can see three barrels, but the flashlight gun was dis discovered in the toolkit of an undercover North Korean assassin in 2011. There's also a poisonous ballpoint pen. Uh, again, another one of those deals that they put a firearm into something innocuous like a flashlight um i mean everybody has a flashlight i mean here's one here it's kind of boogered up but i got one here <laughs> but they figure out how, how to put a Small, small, small caliber gun into one of these things. Oh, don't tempt me, Q. <laughs> so again, it's Assassin's Tool. And talking about a, Assassin's Tools, then we have the Exacto device. And a knife, folks. This has kind of been in theory. But that is a rifle round. Not, not a tank round. Not something that, that you're going to drop out of an airplane. That was made to be fired by a sniper. The Extreme Accuracy Task Ordinance, or Exacto for short, is a device that is being developed by DARPA to increase the accuracy of military snipers. The exact round, once fired, would be able to combine sighting technologies with real-time maneuverability in order to direct, direct a bullet to a target after being fired, which means the sniper never misses. Um, interesting concept, um, and especially with the way technology is, and this is not the first time they've done this. They've actually, the mule for this was tank rounds. And they can take a tank round now and loosely pilot it. Or it can actually pilot itself now to a target. As long as it's in range, you can put in the GPS coordinates fire that round up in the air and it, that round is going to figure out how to get to those coordinates and hit within 10 feet. Now they scale that down to a, a projectile that long. I'm thinking that if they're going to put in anything, it's going to be in a 50 cal. It's, we don't have the technology to go down to like a 308 or a Lapua 338 or anything like that as of yet but a 50 cal we got the technology to go into that 
and a 50 cal is a lethal um, denial weapon used mainly on vehicles. Everybody thinks you should be. No, it was actually a rifle that could be used against tanks, trucks, cars, anything with wheels on it. It could disable it. So you put that in a 50 cal, aim at it something, pull the trigger. As long as you're close to it and it knows what it's looking for, now you're going to hit it. Now you just have to hit it in the right spot. <laughs> okay, that's all for that page. I'm probably going to do a couple more here before I call it the night, but... There's some other weird weapons here that... Well, they were made weird. At the time, they were weird. Now they're a part of history because, well, they worked. And the first one is a trebuchet. Yeah, 50 cal started out as anti-aircraft, but it was on a mounted base. The 50 cal I'm talking about is like a barrack uh, that you carry around, and it's, I wouldn't say a single shot, but most barracks are bolt action. Using a bolt action against a plane, I don't think it's going to go very well, especially if you have to put multiple shots in the air. And this, okay, there we go. Now, if you've never seen a trebuchet, there we go. That is a trebuchet. Now, you kind of look from the right to the left, on the right, that little deal hanging off the end of the pole. That's what you put your uh, ordinance in, which is usually like a, a ball, a stone ball or something. And off to the left, that box hanging there, that was full of weight. And what that did is that weight would drop down, pull the pole so it would go upright, and it would toss the ordinance. Uh, worked very well. It was a very good siege weapon uh, used for knocking down walls or... If you can't knock down... If you couldn't knock down the wall, but you can get the ordinance over the wall, then you can cause destruction inside that wall and maybe make, either maybe make the people inside give up. Yeah, and that wasn't just a Monty Python thing. Another thing, which I might do a little bit later, I actually have a book on where biological or a lot of these terror weapons, biological weapons and stuff started from. This is not anything new. Actually, that was not the first bioweapon. The first bioweapon was plague infected soldiers that had passed. They would actually load them up in catapults and trebuchets and launch them into towns that they're trying to lay siege to to infect those inside if you can weaken the forces inside of what you're trying to breach or what you're laying siege to the easier it's going to be to take it over the dead cows came actually later because they did do that too as i said it's not just a monty python thing it was a real deal forget about catapults the trebuchet was his weighted swing that permitted it to be reloaded quickly and throw whatever was on hand for a full half mile, made it a castle killer. High walls and parapets went out of style when these marvels of physics came, came onto the scene, laying waste to anything that stood still long enough to get hit. Yeah, trebuchet was no joke. 
and once you shot the thing, you just pulled down on the pole, reset it, put another piece of ordnance in, pull the rope, ping, away it goes. Now this next one, people look at it as a weird weapon, but this next one was the precursor to the bow. This is what mankind used before they figured out how to use a limb as a spring to project a pro to throw a projectile. It's called the atlatl, which I still want to make one of these. These things just look neat as heck. There's a bunch of different atlatls there. Now, what that did is there, it would, you put a spear in the one end and you held the other end and you used mechanical leverage to throw the spear it gave it more velocity and gave it more penetrating power but um, many cultures around the world use them there's many different styles of atlatls out there I did actually throw a homemade atlatl once when I went to um uh, Meadow Creek um, or Meadowcroft, sorry, Meadowcroft. What Meadowcroft was, was a Native American rock shelter that was used when they would migrate. It was a stopping point. It wasn't a habitation point. It was, during this day, let's just say it was kind of like the Hotel Six, but instead of staying the night, they would stay for a week, couple months, maybe sometimes the better part of a year until they can get resupplied and keep moving again. It was part of the migration route. But uh, they found atlatls there. I actually threw one of those and actually hit the target. First try, I'm like, hey, I hit the target. First try, I'm walking away from it. But I still want to make one. I still want to learn how to use it because this these things in, interest me. A simple tool that isn't actually a weapon itself. The atlatl is a holder that effectively extends the arm of the user. It gives carriers an easy, easy, accurate way to enhance the deadly distance when chucking spears. Their words, not mine. Not only going further, faster, but punching deeper when they land. So, I mean, it was a highly effective tool. And it was mostly Stone Age. Um, they, toward the end of the Stone Age, they started coming up with it, with this because they found out that they could extend their throw on a elk bison, what have you. It was mostly a hunting weapon that would was used as a war weapon every now and again, but when it wasn't being used for a war weapon, they would use it to hunt with. Okay, now this one is really out there. There's another thing that they actually used. It worked but it's totally impractical. It's called the Tsar tank. Russian tank. Now, if you take a look at this picture, see that right there? Look, I just touched it there. That's a dude standing on it. <laughs> the thing was huge. Absolutely huge. Probably the weirdest armored vehicle ever designed, made in Russia because Russia, the Tsar tank was actually a tricycle that some just knows that caterpillar treads. Each wheel is 27 feet tall. Got that? 27 feet tall. It had its own motor. Actually, they were thinking that, but they found bows in, in that area, too, that were actually older than Otzi. 
So it, could, it still could go either way. Because I was reading about that, and they're like, well, no, because the head was too small, way too small, because Adelaidles had these huge, Adelaidles spears had these huge heads. They never found one that had like a real small head on it. And it was like, it was like a Native American um, arrowhead in his back. Poor engineering caused rear wheel to get mired on the battlefield, which forced it, forced it to be decommissioned after one year. So the Tsar tank, as bizarre, as imposing as it looked, wasn't that great. True Konu. Or, or a repeating crossbow. Yeah, check out it's a crossbow with a magazine on it. But it actually worked. One of the first automatic weapons, the op operation of the Chukonu is something any child could have thought of, and something Nerf has managed to, per to perfect. A repeating crossbow where bolts are loaded into the box on the top. It's not subtle or stealthy, but it also doesn't fire very far. Preferring to throw a lot of a lot of ammo at a problem. Um, yeah, the not the not so far part. I can understand that, but if looking at the size of it, it was a small weapon. So, for close quarter combat, if you can't take them down with one, take them down with a lot. <laughs> okay, we did that one already. Okay, another one that was weird but worked was the Maxim machine gun. Now, it kind of looks like a mod deuce, but not really a mod deuce. Now, if you know what a mod deuce is, that's, that's some good times. Hey, see you later, Tibor. I'm about done anyway. I think it's going to be the last entry here. Here's where the Industrial Revolution really got serious about killing people. Capable of churning out 600 rounds a minute, the Maxim was ugly destruction come to play whenever it was rolled onto the field of battle. About as accurate as a subreddit, so it wasn't the most accurate thing in the world. It made up for weak aim with several metric tons of white-hot lead. So this thing, it was a spray and pray type of deal. You brought the thing out to the battlefield, you pointed it in the general direction, hit the trigger button, it started sweeping back and forth. <laughs> it was a long range street sweeper, if you will. But uh, I think that's about all I have for tonight. I only have about a minute left. Um, I'm going to try to have another live stream on Friday. Uh, about what, I'm not exactly sure yet, but I'm sure I'm going to come up with something. But um, one of the things I think I am going to do on this, on this here, talking about weird, weird weapons and stuff like that, is I have the book. Let's see if I can find it here. Do, 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 do. It's over here someplace. Well, let's put it this way. It's a book of weird, I wouldn't say weird, but unconventional weapons used in ancient times. I'm probably going to... I read the book twice so far. 
I'm going to do a review on the book, probably read some passages on it as well. A uh, very interesting read. Um, especially if you're kind of like, I wouldn't say into warfare, but into strategy. Because there's some very ingenious strategy in some of the tactics, or I'd say some of the things that we look at as now as chemical warfare or biological warfare has been used, been used since the dawn of time. But with that being said, I think I'm going to call it the, I think I'm going to call this um, live stream to an end. So you all have a good night. I love you all. And I'll see you all on Friday. Night, everybody.